The simplest answer is one that will leave you slightly unsatisfied, but at least with your confidence in comprehending basic physical properties intact. You see, glitter is made of glitter. Big glitter begets small glitter, and well, small glitter gets everywhere. All glitter is impossible to remove. Humans, even humans who don't like glitter, like glitter. That's a quote from the New York Times, and who am I to disagree? I am a person who loves glitter. I come from a long family of magpies, women who take their foraging instincts very seriously when it comes to shiny objects. You see, my grandmother is a religious attender of stone and mineral markets, and since I was six, she would ask me what I wanted for her to buy me as a souvenir. And each time, unwaveringly, I replied with the same, a crystal animal figurine. And so over the years, as she went to each and every mineral market, I would get a stone animal. <clears throat> and over time, I have, de I have developed a small but impressive collection of crystal camels, dogs, and tortoises. As to my mother, my mom is much less of a hoarder, however, she does believe that a good pair of golden earrings should go with every outfit, and she effectively implemented it in her life. As to my sister and I, well, I mentioned myself earlier, so I'll focus on my sister here. You see, when my sister was six, so the perfect age for mischief and limited internet access, she decided it would be a perfect idea to emulate the popular unicorn hairstyle that was popular at the time. You see, Women would divide their hair into two braids or buns and then put glitter hairspray in the middle to give it that shiny unicorn feel. And so my sister, with her impressionable young mind and a can of glitter we had just bought for a school project, decided it would be the perfect idea to dump all of its shimmery contents onto her hair. The glitter that she dumped that day, which was probably the most exhilarating day of her six-year-old life, with the same glitter my mom had to wash out of her hair for the next three months, and it's the same glitter, the suspects of which continue to be stuck to our wooden floor staircase to this day, seven years later. And you see, just how the glitter that stuck to our staircase continues to live there forever and probably till we sell the house, the humanity and shiny objects have been intertwined for centuries. More specifically, Shiny objects have been around for, with humanity for around 5,000 years, which on a geological time scale is a relatively short period. When we first think of shiny objects, one of the first things we think of are diamonds. After all, diamonds are a girl's best friend. Diamonds have been relatively recently with us, as the first mention of diamonds comes from a, 300, a, text, a Sanskrit text discovered around dated around 300 years before Christ from a northern Indian dynasty minister. However, it wasn't until the 13th century that diamonds came to Europe and became popularized here. However, as the rest of Europe relished in their newly found shiny rocks, King Louis IX of France decided to cut the fun short right there by, pro by proclaiming a royal decree that prohibited anyone else from himself, the king, from wearing diamonds. One of the most popular uses for diamonds nowadays are diamond engagement rings. And for that we can thank Archduke Maximilian of Austria, who in 1477 commissioned the very first diamond ring for his betrothed, Mary of Burgundy. However, diamonds aren't the only shiny things humanity, humanity has loved, and aren't even the first. For centuries, humans have loved a different shiny object, the pearl. Pearls have been with us for around 5,000 years. There have been popular status symbols in ancient Rome and Greece, as well as China, and around 4,000 years ago have still been given to Chinese royalty as symbols of ultimate respect. However, again, just like with diamonds, by the time Julius Caesar came to rule the Roman Empire, he had decided it would be best to limit the number of people who can wear pearls. And so he prohibited anyone, from, rather than the aristocracy, from wearing pearls. However, as we see, one of the most popular stories centering pearls is the story of Queen Cleopatra. When Queen Cleopatra was who it came to rule in Egypt, she decided to, with, to, to put a bet with her lover, Mark, Mark Anthony of Rome. For that bet, she was supposed to hold the most expensive banquet of all times. And so the night of the banquet, when Mark Anthony came and looked around the table, she decided to prove once and for all 
the expenses and riches that she possessed. And so she took off her pearl earring, her pearl earring that was considered to be the most expensive pearl in all of history, and dropped it in a glass of vinegar. As the pearl was completely dissolved in the glass of vinegar, she picked it up and drank it, winning the bet against her lover. She then proceeded to, to give the other pearl to her lover, who, who refused to drink the pearl and admitted she had won. Seeing for how long shiny objects have been part of humanity's history, it is natural that we have decided to come up with stories that centered around them. And tons, we come to the myth of Peter Manui. Peter Manui was a Dutch colony governor, and so when he came to the new land in 1626, he brought with him a treasure chest full of glass beads. These glass beads were what he used to buy the island of Manhattan. While historians debate whether glass beads were actually used in the purchase, the story of Peter Manu buying Manhattan for merely 20, for a mere 24 dollars of glass beads has been repeated throughout history and still remains what he is known for today. However, as much as we see humanity loving shiny objects, the question still stands. Why is it that we love them so much? You see, the characteristic of shininess is one that is rarely found in nature. When we think of shiny things in nature, our mind naturally gravitates to, us, to bodies of water. Lakes, rivers, streams, anything that's reflective is usually wet. We as humans have three innate needs, and those needs are the need for sleep, the need for food, and the need for water. And it is the last one that dictates the reason why we love shiny objects so much. You see, from an evolutionary perspective, we as humans need water, and so it is in our best interest to be able to find bodies of water quite easily. And seeing as, body, as bodies of water have this very simple characteristic, they're shiny, it is natural that our minds gravitate towards shiny objects because of this evolutionary need. Since the 1990s, a total of six experiments have been done to prove this connection between our need for water and the fact that we like shiny objects. The very first experiment had a very simple basis. Participants were presented with four blank pieces of paper that were, that were, different, that were either glossy, matte, shiny matte, or polished. And so, after looking at the pieces of paper, they were supposed to rate how wet they think the paper was. And the results came back, and the, scientists were, and the scientists proved their hypothesis correct. The glossy paper was considered to be much more wet on a wet to dry scale than the rest of the papers. Additionally, the glossy and shiny papers were considered to be much more attractive by most of the participants. This experiment was done once again. However, this time, the participants were blindfolded which seems kind of counterintuitive, seeing as how we're trying to see whether shiny objects attract our attention. However, the point was very interesting. You see, the participants which were blindfolded, but touched the texture of the paper, and were later asked to think what landscape these, this, these pictures could present. And when they were asked to describe the, picture, the landscapes that were on the glossy paper, they usually described landscapes that contain water. So oceans, seas, lakes, rivers are like under, underwater systems. However, when they were asked to describe the landscape that was presented on the map paper, without seeing it, they opted for landscapes that contained little to no water, such as deserts or mountains. Another experiment, again, took this very basic premise and built up on it. In this case, a group of 140 participants were divided into three. While one of the groups received crackers, the other received crackers with water, and the third one received neither. After eating the crackers and drinking the water, they were asked to rate how attractive and desirable the thing they think photographs that were printed on glossy and matte paper were. And again, the conclusion was the same. While all of the groups preferred glossy paper, the group that was given crackers beforehand and was thus considered the most thirsty of all the groups, consider them to be much more desirable and much more attractive. So scientists concurred that possibly because the group was more thirsty, they were naturally more drawn to the photographs that reminded them of water. In a North Carolina University study in 2014, they again took the simple premise and built up on it even more. 
However, in this case, if they weren't using photographs, a group of six, and they divided a group of 140 students into six groups and gave each group a box with five items. While three of the items remained the same for all groups and were considered buffer items, a plastic baby shoe, wooden candle holder, and a pebbled glass fermentation weight, two of the objects differed between each group. Those two objects were a, a silver coin and a copper bar. While one of the groups received a shiny sil silver coin in their new minted state and a shiny copper bar, the others received a mix of either a slightly tarnished copper bar that was brushed, so it's kind of silky, smooth, slightly shiny, but still tarnished, or a fully tarnished copper bar, and additionally, either a shiny minted coin or a fully tarnished one. And again, after getting acquainted with the items, they were asked to rate on a scale from one to seven how desirable, attractive, and interesting they thought the objects were. All of the groups agreed that the, the more shiny the copper bar and, the, and penny was, the more attractive and desirable they deemed it to be. They also deemed it to be, them to have more quality and be more interesting than the ones that were tarnished. However, in all of these experiments, the scientists were worried about one thing, bias. You see, after years and years of humans being taught the connection between shyness and wealth, or shyness and expensive, or shyness and good quality, they were worried that the reason these adult participants were choosing the shiny objects was because they were taught that's the object they're supposed to like. And so, they continued the studies, however this time with children. A group of children up to 12 months was placed in a room with both dull and shiny plates and left alone to their own devices but under the observation of the scientists. And funnily enough, all of the children there naturally gravitated towards the shiny plates and were much more likely to lick the shiny plates rather than the dull ones. Additionally, the experiment with the photographs was repeated again, however now on children of the age of four years. And those four-year-old children, which were deemed by the scientists to be too young to have this learned connection between shyness and wealth, still chose the glossy photographs as being much more attractive than the matte ones, solidifying the idea that the reason why we love shiny objects so much is because our innate need for water comes before the learned connotations of shyness with wealth. Funnily enough, humans aren't the only species to love shiny objects. Barracuda fish are one of the most interesting species of fish out there. They're one of the very few fish species that hunt based on their, sight of, on their sense of sight, meaning they, they search for their prey rather than by their smell, by their eyesight. Their main prey constitutes a very silvery type of fish whose fins are very reflective of the sunlight that comes through the water. And so when people go into waters, there are possibly barracuda fish could be present, they're usually asked to take off their jewelry, which could attract the barracuda fish, who, mis who mistakenly thinking that the tiny jewelry or the fish that they're supposed to eat could, attack, plus could possibly attack the humans coming into the water. On the contrary, magpies, which like I said earlier, I come from a long family of magpies, have been scientifically disproven to love shiny objects. You see, most of the evidence that magpies like shiny items has been mostly anecdotal. However, when Oxford ran experiments where they gave magpies a shiny and dull item, the magpies were much more likely to pick up the dull item rather than the shiny one. And if, even if they did pick up the shiny one, they would usually drop it relatively quickly. You see, that is because, again, instinctive needs come first. And the magpies were worried that if they would take the shiny objects to their nest, that could attract additional attention, additional unwanted attention that could result in potential danger for themselves and their young. And that is why they opted for the dull items. Seeing as our time here has almost come to an end, I'd like to leave you with one last thought of how evolutionary purposes guide us and many other species through centuries, even though we as humans might think that we have outgrown them. And so the next time you feel tempted to look at the Swiss watches or the Swarovski crystal collection, or feel the need to pick up a piece of glass or aluminum foil that you see on the street, I want you to take a step back and think, is it perhaps I'm just thirsty? Thank you.